Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it four hundred and fifty. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it eight hundred. The master condemned the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are the people of the light. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. Let's pray as we open God's word. Lord, we thank you for this Stewardship Sunday when you give us an opportunity to think about all the blessings of our lives, all the responsibilities you've entrusted us with, and giving us the opportunity to decide how we use these gifts. Give us wisdom. Give us courage and grace. Show us the ways that your grace can not only come to us, but come through us. We ask it in your name. Amen. Well, today we continue in our Stewardship Sermon Series. We actually conclude it, Faithful Stewards of God's Grace. The inspiration comes from the central passage for this series from 1 Peter. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So stewardship is another way of saying that each of us has been invited to take part in sharing God's grace. The way God works to save, heal, liberate, and empower, we're to share that with the whole world. That means that to be a faithful steward of God's grace is taking the grace that God gives us and sharing it with others. We use it to serve. As we've said, there are at least three ways that we can practice good stewardship. We use our time, our talents, and our treasures in service of God's kingdom. In this series, we're picturing God's grace working in three different ways. When we use our time well, God's grace can come to us. When we use our talents well, God's grace can come through us. And when we use our treasures well, God's grace can come from us. Now, that's a little bit of a misnomer. Of course, God's grace really only comes from God. Only God can transform lives with salvation and healing and liberation and empowering, etc. However, God does choose to entrust us with resources and allow us to decide how to use them. So when we choose to use them for God's purposes, to honor God and to serve others, then in a way, that grace that people are experiencing is coming from us. We're taking what God has given us and sharing it in God's name with those God loves. So as we close today, we'll think about how God calls us to use our treasures. How can we use our treasures so that God's grace can come from us? Now, this is usually the part of stewardship that some of us dread. When the minister starts talking about money. However, we're not really here to hear what I think. We want to know what God thinks, right? What are God's values when it comes to how we use our money? To answer that question, we're going to look at possibly the oddest of all Jesus' parables. The parable of the dishonest steward. 
Now, wait a minute. I thought this series was supposed to be about being a faithful steward, being a good steward, right? So why are we looking at a dishonest steward? For that matter, why would Jesus tell a story about a dishonest steward? These are just the first of many questions that come with this story. But Jesus must have had some point. And it seems to be a point about how he wants us to use money. So let's see if we can figure out what it is. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. The first thing we notice about this manager, or steward, is that he's not exactly a role model. First of all, he gets fired for being incompetent, for wasting his master's possessions. And then, what is his response? He's very honest as he talks to himself about his options. He freely admits that he's both lazy and proud. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Remember that old song by the Temptations, Ain't Too Proud to Beg? Wasn't written by this guy. He is too proud to beg. That's what he says. So what will he do? Turn over a new leaf? Become an honest, hard-working contributor to society? Not exactly. He has a different plan. Verse 5. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. So what is his plan to make sure that people will welcome him into their houses? Defraud his former employee employer even further by falsifying all his accounts. There's no question about it. This guy is a crook. And of course, the people in debt go along with it. It saves them money. The one who's really going to lose out is the master. He was trying to put his business affairs in order by getting rid of a dishonest, incompetent steward, and he ends up getting swindled out of even more money. Now, none of this is necessarily unusual, People conduct dishonest business every day. It's a little unusual that Jesus would feature someone like this as the main character of one of his stories. But maybe that's just to show us what not to do. When this guy gets what's coming to him, maybe it'll serve as a reminder for us that honesty is the best policy or something like that. But here's the thing. That's not what happens. Instead... It's something strange. The conclusion of this little story is completely unexpected. And that's the point of the story. By the way, this is almost always how Jesus' narrative parables work. He always has people acting in weird, unexpected ways. And in the weirdness, that's where we find the message. Think about some of the parables that you remember. How about the parable of the sower? where the farmer goes out to plant his seeds and he just slings them all over the place and some land in the road and some in the thorns and some in the rocks and some on the good soil. The truth is, that's bad farming. I mean, why are you just throwing it all these crazy places? Only put it where it's going to grow. Wouldn't that make more sense? But not to this farmer. Or what about the parable of the lost sheep? Do you remember that one? Jesus said, who of you, if you had a hundred sheep and one wandered away and got lost, which of you... Wouldn't you leave the 99 and go and search for the one? And every time he asks that question, I always say to myself, no, it's not my fault the stupid one sheep got lost. I'm going to stay with the 99. It makes a lot more sense. I can afford to have a 1% loss this year, right? You know what I'm saying? It just doesn't make any sense to me. But it does to that shepherd. How about the good Samaritan? A man is traveling and he gets beat up and left for dead and robbed by the side of the road. And along comes a priest, a holy person. But the priest doesn't help him. And then comes a Levite, a holy person, but the Levite doesn't help him. And so you can tell Jesus is setting us up. And so the next person who comes is going to be even more holy than that, and it's going to be awesome, and it's a Samaritan. 
That's not a holy person. That's a sacrilegious person. That's one of our enemies. That's crazy. And yet the Samaritan turns out to be the hero. How about the parable that immediately precedes this one in the Gospel of Luke? The parable of the prodigal son. Anything weird about that? First of all, if you tell your dad, can you give me all the stuff I'm going to get when you die, even though you're not dead yet? The answer is usually no. And yet the father gives it to him freely. Now, it's not necessarily surprising that he goes off and wastes it all as a young man. But then he comes back and asks to be a slave. And the father says, no, I want you back as my son. And throws a big party. What kind of weird stories are these? I would say two things. First of all, the kind of stories that we remember. We're still talking about them 2,000 years later. They stay with you, which means that the message they contain also stays with you, even if we don't get it yet. Second, their very strangeness communicates a larger point. The kingdom of God is different. God's kingdom has completely different values, different priorities, different ways of operating, different everything. And compared to the values and the priorities of this world, God's kingdom is weird. Jesus wants us to get used to that. He not only wants us to become familiar with the unique weirdness of the kingdom, he wants us to begin living by it. That's what it means to be part of God's kingdom. It means that we turn away from the conventional wisdom of the world and adopt the weird wisdom of God. The wisdom that scatters goodness everywhere like that crazy farmer, even in places that don't deserve it. That leaves the 99 to go and search for the one, the one that messed up his own life. That defines holiness in a new way, not by doctrines or by position in society, but by compassion. A, whole, a, a, a wisdom that trusts extravagantly then forgives extravagantly, then celebrates extravagantly, like the prodigal's father. God is weird. It's true. But even so, the weirdness of God is truer and better and realer than anything the world has to offer. That's why we keep trying to get into the kingdom, because we've discovered that's where real life is. Now, that's all well and good with most of Jesus' parables. Most of them, even though they're weird, we can still see the point. But with this one, the dishonest manager, the weirdness just seems baffling. It's not strange that this man acts dishonestly. What's strange is how the master in the story reacts and how Jesus reacts. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. So this dishonest steward, this crook, isn't punished. He isn't even told off. He's commended. He's congratulated by his former master, and even by Jesus. Why? It isn't because they admired his deceit or his stealing. But the master in the story basically says, I know you're a thief and you're lazy and you're a liar, but you ain't dumb. That's what he means by acting shrewdly. The steward in this story knows how his world works. He knows that people value money even if the means of getting it may not be honest. He knows that if he, does, if he does a favor for them, they'll remember it, and that'll serve him well down the line. In a crooked world, this guy understands it, and he uses it shrewdly for his benefit. And Jesus says, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. In other words, people who only care about money who think that's what life is all about, as messed up as their values are, at least they act in ways that are consistent with their values. They get money, 
even if they have to lie and steal. They act shrewdly within their principles. But we have different values, different principles. We should act as shrewdly around what we believe. We don't believe that getting money, getting more money, will make us live happily ever after. Why? Because we know that money doesn't always make people happy. And even when it does, it's never ever after. Every life ends. One day this whole world will end. And then will come something else. A new world. The real world that will never end. And what we do in this life, this temporary world, will echo forever in the eternal world. So in verse 9, Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus is telling us to act shrewdly within our principles. If we know that money is only temporary, that it won't last forever, just like this world won't last forever, then we shouldn't make money or this world our highest priority. Instead, we should use money as a resource and invest it in something that will last forever. Something like the kingdom of God and people. Those are the two things that will last forever, the kingdom of God and people. So that's what we should be using our treasures, our resources, our time, our talents to invest in. That's stewardship. Using what God has given us wisely, shrewdly, according to God's values. When we do, it doesn't just change our lives and other people's lives now. It can have effects that will ripple throughout eternity. Think of it this way. Has anyone ever done something for you that you will never forget? Some kindness, some mercy, some compassionate help that changed your life? So much so that it's been part of making you who you are and you will always remember as long as you live? Jesus is saying, okay, go do stuff like that. Use your money for that. Because in the end, those things will be of more value than all the money in the world. With this in mind, remembering God's values that we have adopted as our values, we come to Stewardship Sunday. This is why we choose to share what we have, to pool our money together to do God's work. Today is the day that we make our financial pledges for the coming year and how we choose to participate. And as we do, I have to brag on our church a little bit. There are lots of reasons I've learned that people give to the church. Sometimes it's out of a sense of obligation. Sometimes it's guilt. Some people think of giving to the church like paying a bill. I consume services from the church, therefore I should pay for it. But I don't think any of those are really the right reasons to give. I don't think any of those are the reasons that the people of our church give. You know why I can say that? Because of what has happened this year. Our stewardship team will tell you what I'm sure you already know. 2020 has been a messed up year. We started this year with all these plans, all kind of ministries we wanted to do, and the budgets to go with them. And the congregation had pledged to support the budget and all those ministries. And then, sometime in mid-March, it all went south. Many of the plans we had made, we were unable to follow through on. For 20 straight weeks, we weren't even able to be in this room to worship together on Sundays. And all those other ministries, the plans for outreach and property and evangelism and church life and education and all that other stuff, we weren't able to follow through on most of it, at least not in the way we planned. But you know what we did follow through on? Our giving. In spite of all the uncertainty and the canceled plans and the unrealized hopes, people kept on giving. 
The members of our congregation had made pledges, and we have kept those pledges. Each month, our giving budget has held steady. You know what that tells me? We don't give out of, out of a sense of obligation or guilt or because we're buying something. We give because it's a natural part of our spiritual practice. We give because God has given to us and we want to share that grace with others. We've made it a habit. We give because we want to be faithful stewards and live our lives according to God's values. The world can do what it wants. We're going to continue to be faithful. The truth is, a church like that doesn't really need a stewardship sermon. Oh, I'm still going to give you one. In fact, I've given you three. But you were doing pretty well with stewardship before I ever got here. And I just want to say, I'm proud to be your minister. To serve in a church of faithful stewards. So for those of you who don't know, we have a tradition here on Stewardship Sunday. We have a little wooden church that we put down front. And then during this service, those who are ready can bring their pledge down and put them into the little church. It's just our way of symbolizing this decision to share what we've been given in faithful stewardship. So in just a moment, I will give time for those who wish to submit their pledge today. By the way, we also have an electronic pledge card using the QR code or the Linktree link if you're worshiping online today at the top of your online feed. You can choose pledge card and fill out the information there and it'll automatically be sent. However you choose to pledge, whether it's in person or through the mail or online, the only people who will ever see it are our treasurer and our financial secretary. We believe giving should be private. We don't give to impress each other. We do it to be faithful to God. So take these next few moments to consider how God is calling you to participate in the budget for 2021. And if you're ready, you can bring your pledge forward at this time. For those of you who haven't had a chance to fill out your pledges yet, there are several ways that you can submit it. You can mail it to the church office and we'll pass it on to the treasurer. You can bring it with you next Sunday and place it in one of our offering boxes. You can use the online pledge card using the Linktree app or the QR code. The stewardship team asks that everyone please complete their pledges by next Sunday, August, October the 4th. Uh, we need that information as we, we begin planning next year's budget. So let me close today's time with the scripture that's at the center of our series, 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We know the values that God calls us to live by, the values of God's kingdom. May we use our resources shrewdly as faithful members, faithful stewards of God's grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for entrusting us with all that you have, for giving us the years of our lives, for giving us financial resources, 
for giving us abilities and talents and opportunities to use them. And the truth is, most of us have used these things to make a life for ourselves, to have a home and to have all the things we need to survive and thrive. Teach us, Lord, to have the same excitement and eagerness to see your kingdom spread, to see this community be as healthy as it can be, this community of faith, to see this community serve in world-changing ways all around us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to take part in this kingdom that you're building. We ask these things in Christ's name.